wish to just first of all welcome everybody here. I imagine you might be guests of a member for Wallandilly. <laughs> so. So in accordance with the earlier resolution, the presentation of an inaugural speech by the member for Wallandilly will now proceed. Before I call the member for Wallandilly, however, I wish to warmly welcome all of you who are here in the public gallery to watch the member for Wallandilly's inaugural speech, which includes family and friends. I believe Mr Laurie Ferguson, former federal member for Reid, may be here. Is that correct? And I believe perhaps Ms. Uh, Kerry Chikorovsky, the former member for... Is that correct? Is Kerry here yet? Oh, I keep, I keep misplacing her. That's twice this week. Okay. So uh, per, per, perhaps she will be here. But regardless, I'm sure it's going to be a, a wonderful inaugural speech. And I call the member for Wallandilly. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I say what a joy it is to be here and introduced to here in this House by an, as an independent member by an independent speaker yeah, yeah. and surrounded by noisy political parties on both the left and the right, <laughs> with so many independents in our very considered and influential crossbench. My inaugural speech claim, for, and many inaugural speeches claim, for a hope of big political opportunities and careers to come, and a desire for the ministry. From my perspective, and the people I represent in Wallandilly, there are no personal aspirations to get in the way of what is most important and what we can achieve along the way. I'm ready to take on the challenge and bring all my life experiences and learnings to the parliament. The late and the great Dr Zeus wrote, the more you read, the more things you will know. The more you learn, the more places you will go. Lifelong learning is what motivates me to defeat the challenges for myself and to help others. The start of my journey, in many ways, began with my mother, who was always helping someone in our community. She was one of the first Queen's Guide in Western Sydney, and when I was seven, she enrolled me in Brownies. And to this day, I remember the promise I made on receiving my badge. It went like, I promise to do my best to do my duty to my God and my Queen to help other people every day, especially those at home. I can see that. <laughs> and I learnt that a promise is something you make for life and that home meant community. A promise not made lightly and a promise I hope to continue to fulfil for my community. I was raised in Western Sydney with a very mixed background, Chinese, Spanish, Scottish and English grandparents, a diverse gene pool with a mix and eclectic family and I learnt that diverse heritage was something to be very, very proud of. As a child I thought our family were very rich but as the years went on I learnt the family was simply rich in experience, love and experience. We made party hats from newspaper and kites from broken school rulers and we used to let them go and we'd chase them for what seemed like miles. My father was an exceptional sportsman. He made basketball hoops for me and high jumps. He ran kilometres with me to help me prepare for cross-country races. I'm not sure about pinching the top of your nose to forget you've got a stitch, but anyway. <laughs> His most incredible effort was for every morning he sat outside freezing while I clocked up many laps of Granville swimming pool. My claim to fame was swimming in the next heat of the 100 metres freestyle just after Shane Gould broke the world record. That was a hard act to follow, but I always tried to do my best and I learnt that someone is always faster than you. I still enjoy swimming, but I shined most when I played hockey and the grass fields I played on were very rough and they were very different to the astroturf that we have these days. When the ball was headed to the sideline and it seemed useless to chase, I kept on going because often there was a bump in the grass that would hold that ball up and seeing as everybody else had given up, I used to take that advantage and often scored. Some say I was stubborn, but I'd already learnt never to give up, no matter how long it seems to take. And others began to learn that they shouldn't underestimate my determination. 
My parents also taught me that humour is very important. My parents had an engineering business and there were large bales of, of metal that they would raise on a platform using a big metal pole. And one day my father slipped and the, the bar hit him on the head and split his head open. My mother drove him quickly to the hospital and she couldn't find a parking space, so she let him out of the car in the ambulance bay. This was at Auburn Hospital, Auburn District Hospital, and she went to find a car spot. Inside, my father stumbled to the counter and told the staff that his wife had hit him over the head. <laughs> As a joke. As she entered the hospital and faced the glares of the nurses, she learnt, and believe me, later on, he learnt, <laughs> that jokes can cause a problems for you if they're, not, if they're inappropriate. I dread to think what might have happened if he'd actually died. I learnt education was a privilege. My mother was very frustrated by being denied the opportunity for tertiary education as women were taught to go to work, get a husband and have children. When she had three daughters, she ensured we were all given the opportunity. I attended Parramatta High School and went to University of New South Wales. I remember on enrolment day, someone looking over my shoulder and reading my address. And they said, Granville, how did you get here? I learnt you should never judge anyone on appearance or where, you, where they come from. <laughs> I studied and became an optometrist and while many of my fellow students opened optometry practices in fancy inner city locations, for me I always look closer to home for those that I can help. For many years I looked after the eyes of my childhood community in Granville, Lidcombe and Guildford. In fact, quite a few of the members in this place or their families have had their eyes tested for, by me at one time or another. <laughs> and I would recognise Laurie Ferguson, the former member for Reid. I know somebody said it was their Laurie Ferguson, but I said it's my Laurie Ferguson. <laughs> I was always ringing Laurie's staff to get some problems sorted out for a constituent. He was one of the hardest working members I have ever known. At work, I applied my brownie promise in helping those, especially those at home. During those years, as an optometrist, I was often covered my, by my friends, Sam Chu and Andrew McKinnon, some of the Optometry Association and my staff, while sadly having several miscarriages and a stillbirth along the way, learning that some things in life stay with you forever. Besides achieving a mediation, hypnotherapy, private investigator's licence and MBA qualifications, I've worked as an optometrist my whole career and finished my optometry life as the chair of the Optometry Board of Australia, where we were working on getting better health outcomes, especially for rural, remote Indigenous populations. With this and many other times in my life as a counsellor, I learnt that bureaucracy takes way too long. <laughs> it was in the Lidcombe practice that my political life began although I think there's as much politics in PNC and the local dog club, <laughs> uh, I had a call from my mother's solicitor, many of you will remember Wayne Merton, saying they were looking for a candidate for the Auburn by-election. I said, no, of course, as any sensible person would do, but the person... <laughs> I had been the Chamber of Commerce president and well known in the area by my maiden name. Encouraged by a patient I was seeing at the time, I finally agreed, even though I now lived in Wallandilly. I learned to take an opportunity and never stay in your comfort zone. I also learned that you could win pre-selection in two days, even if you're not a member of a party, if no one else wants that seat. <laughs> <laughs> as it was an incredibly safe seat, <laughs> as it was an incredibly safe seat, I was highly unlikely to get elected, although it was one of the biggest swings against the Carr government. That election campaign, I became friends with many members in this place, including Kerry Chikorowski, who was the opposition leader. Others, both in government and opposition, with former premiers and members helping me in their much younger years. I learnt a hell of a lot. But I also learnt that later, despite friendships and efforts, others can disrupt and steer their own agenda for personal political gain. After the Auburn by-election, where the lovely Barbara Perry became the member, I realised you could get attention for the plights of the community. I thought that it would be amazing to get the same attention for my home, so I decided to run for council in Wallandilly Shire Council in 2004. My first election was at a time when there were, no, there were only independents, no parties in Wallandilly Shire Council, no teams, just a list of five names. And I stood in North Ward and I had the honour of being elected an honour I've continued to hold to this day after being re-elected many times over. But it wasn't smooth sailing in 2004. The same day I was told I was elected to council, 
I was informed by a very glum looking GP that I had adenocarcinoma and they didn't know where the primary was. I actually can't remember my first two years on council as I had many rounds of chemo, radiation and surgery. Once when I was feeling very sorry for myself, a young child in the radiation clinic was sitting there with no hair, very pale, sitting in a wheelchair, dressed in a hospital gown and looked at me and said, are you okay? I told myself to buck up. I had nothing to complain about and I learnt someone is always worse off than you. During this time, there was a drug called Herceptin that took my chances of survival from 50-50 to 95-5. Problem was the cost, $3,300 every three weeks for an entire year. Coincidentally, close to the same amount as a political donation cap in the New South Wales election. <laughs> so even though I felt extremely unwell, I worked really hard to afford it. But how could I sit next to another woman who couldn't? I learned about the unfairness of financial inequity, but also the fruits of advocacy. With loads of help, I managed to get the drug PBS listed. I got my last treatment for free, but others that followed would get their entire treatment covered. I also volunteered to have my reconstruction surgery on TV, unknowingly sharing the screen with Sarah Jane from Big Brother having her breast reduction. <laughs> I did this to encourage others to check themselves and to act, to do my duty and fulfil my pledge that I took when I was seven years old. I have enjoyed, mostly, the years spent on Wallanilly Council as Mayor and Councillor, often being the sole female in all levels of government locally. With this, I've learnt to have a very thick skin. In many ways, Wallandilly and Windsor Caribbean have always had strong independent voices, both with mayors and local councillors many strong personalities, long-time councillors like my friend Emeritus Mayor Michael Benassik and often political opponent Cole Mitchell were all unique and very colourful. Phil Costa too, as an independent councillor who was selected in the final term of the former Labor government, really was suited to either benches of the government or opposition, as he and I have learnt that local politics, often political parties, can get in the way. I thank all those councillors who I've worked with over the years, with a huge thank you to Councillor Bev Spearpoint, who pulls up the boys club when the bullying starts. Yes, sadly, it still occurs. To my many running mates and friends around the council table, table including Robert Kahn, Noel Lowry, Matt Gould, Di Lange, Michael Bashara, Simon Lando, the late Terry Atkinson, the late Shane Reid, and Ben Benassik, who was once my political adversary, now friend and my political advisor. I'm not sure of the promise of threat to chain himself to me all those years ago to protect some sort of area. I was pleased to serve as councillor with many of you and the campaigning I did with many of you for all those council elections. I value your friendship more than anything. As an independent councillor for close to 20 years, I have learnt it's tough to do it on your own. And by accepting help from my community and others, you can level the playing field with the parties. I have learnt the value of building a movement and the real power of my community. To this end, I thank the donors and helpers for the 2023 election who asked for nothing in return. Some were Greens, some Conservative, some just believers in workers' rights, the firefighters who campaigned strongly, the nurses and teachers who bust themselves every day for the benefit of all of us and many good friends and some people who just wanted to make a difference. During the state campaign, I met others who stood and were passionate about their communities. Many of them are women. Many of them being tagged as a group called the Teals. For anyone that's not in a major party, the parties like to tag you. And they seem to do this with the media to diminish the passion you have for your area and your electorate. So while women's rights have improved, we've got a long way to go. The women who've been successful in getting into this place have learnt to deal with a structure and a system often limiting what we can do and achieve. And it's not just pointing this out to women, but critically to every member, we all need to learn this. Just last week, I'm being invited to turn the side of the Performing Arts Centre in Wallandilly that I got the funding for when I was mayor. I learnt that the builders assumed that the member for Wallandilly was certainly one of the men there. And sadly, even in the lift in Parliament this Tuesday, I was asked by another member who I worked for. 
I'm still unable to understand how sticking up for gender equity, looking after our environment and most important, integrity, is something to be snarled at. Perhaps it is that the major parties feel the threat of someone with authenticity and passion. Some of these women were close to being in this place, including Jackie Scrooby, Karen Fryer, Jolene Hackman, Victoria Davidson, Helen Conway and Elizabeth Farrelly. To these independent, strong women, don't give up. I have learnt how New South Wales has missed out on your skills and intelligence, and I look forward to a day when you are here so Parliament can also learn what fantastic representation you can bring. Wallandilly. As my friend Ali Dench calls it, I live in God's country. Wallandilly is full of bird life, kingfishers, cockatoos and lyrebirds. If I talk to you on my phone while I'm at home, you can hear the bellbirds ringing or my guinea fowl good lucking. They seem to have adopted me as their unwilling leader. They come running when they hear my car come home or they look when they see me through the window of a morning. It was with much shock on arriving in my parliamentary office a week or two ago that on the wall was a painting of a guinea fowl. Coincidence? Probably. But maybe it was a sign I was meant to be here. We have goannas that steal my chookheads, wombats, kangaroos and koalas. And a few years ago, I delivered a petition with over 13,000 signatures to save our chlamydia-free koalas and was so disheartened when the chamber talked about it not even for five minutes. Mind you, not as disappointed as I have been with the, cl the clearing of the habitat that remains there now. I have learnt that Parliament does not always recognise what the community value. With changing climates, Wallandilly has suffered numerous floods and fires in the past couple of years. It is, however, one of the most naturally beautiful places in New South Wales, but it is also one of the most neglected by everyone except for land bankers and developers. We need to protect our unique lifestyle, our farmers who supply much of the food for Sydney. We can have some development, but we also need the infrastructure to match. We are larger than the entire Sydney metropolitan area and we only have a very small underfunded hospital, two public high schools, no tertiary education provision, a major town connected by a one lane bridge and a hole in the wall, and I might add a bypass promise for over 30 years, as well as an almost non-existent, badly timed public transport system. And as a minister said to me a couple of hours ago, you stand to gain a lot here because you've got nothing at the moment. <laughs> we have families living in Coles and Woolworths car park because of the shortage of housing and the rising cost of living. And I invite you all to a forum in my electorate in July to bring together the stakeholders to find solutions. Let's remember the Wallandilly My Electorate is 95 kilometres from one end, Warragamba, to the other, Baradur. It encompasses both Wallandilly and Winter Caribbean Council areas. Everything requires long travel times, whether it's to go to school, to hospital, to work, through our massively crumbling roadwork system. I have learnt you can have huge developments, but the promised infrastructure does not necessarily follow. It's time the developers and government learn that you cannot treat a community like this, and my election in many ways shows that my community has had enough. My electorate is made up of many small villages and towns, and they're all very different. It is the land of the Dharal and Gundagara people who I acknowledge today, and I know one of our young Indigenous ladies is here with us as well. It is home to Sydney's water supply, and thank goodness to the irreplaceable Indigenous heritage areas, the endangered flora and fauna is hopefully now out of danger with the threat of the government to raise the Warragamba wall being extinguished. I have learned how lucky I am to live in Wallandilly. We've got the new airport on our northern border and landowners have had nonsensical impositions placed on their rights that need to be reviewed. You can now build a house with 10 bedrooms on acreage, but not two houses with two bedrooms. We've had privately owned land locked up and used as offsets by government for the new Aerotropolis city. It's just not right. In other parts of the electorate, we've had rezoning for thousands of houses being made overnight with no community consultation and in secrecy. I have learnt action needs to be taken to stop this and no account must, and, and we need to take account of the environment, the affordability to live there, the long travel times and the lack of necessary health services for our ageing population, particularly in the southern end of the electorate. Unfulfilled promises of infrastructure and the loss of agricultural land 
just to name a few of the issues. One time, while I was doing this and advocating, I was attacked by Alan Jones on radio. I was invited him out to my electorate, but I did insist that he catch the public transport out there. <laughs> I never heard from him again, surprise, and I learnt that you can call that empty threat, and I joined the honour of likes of Jacinta Ardern and prominent women that Alan Jones had targeted. The Wallandilly electorate has been taken for granted by both major parties, one because they think they own it and the other because they say it's too hard to win. Funds and grants should not be divided on the criteria of a fight to win a seat. With the West Invest or the Black Summers funding, we did not get anywhere near our fair share. Funds went to electorates that were not affected or already had amazing facilities. The criteria that is used against us on many occasions is if the funding's for metropolitan, we're called rural. If it's for rural, we're called metropolitan. Yeah. We have seniors unable to get the $250 travel allowances in areas that are over 50 kilometres from any public transport. I have, and I hope the parties have learnt, there is no such thing as a safe seat. Yeah. I need to do my best and to do my duty. Thank you to the many people, some are who are here today and some who aren't. Some who've been friends for many years and some more recently. The Bates, the Booths, the Bjorklands. I'm sure you will see your names mentioned in public acclamations. I have the chance to make in Parliament, as most of you continue to do selfless community work for Wallandilly. Mr Speaker, can I please ask for an extension? You may certainly do that. The question is, but members time be extended. All of that opinion say aye. Aye. No. Please. Thank you. Thomas I do have some very special thank yous. The whole campaign team, ably led by the amazing Di Mills and her partner in crime, Louise Edgecombe, who is the best graphic designer and now the manager of my office. Without these two ladies, I'd not be here today. There were over 200 local people who worked tirelessly on the campaign, and they are team duty, and I thank each and every one of you. A special thank you to the beautiful couple of Jan and Royce Wilson, your family to me. The Whites, the Barretts, Keith, Virginia, Alex, Brett, Frank, Graham, Ali and Sandra. A special shout out to Sue and John, who were kicked out of their home for 40 years for no other reason than political revenge. I feel like I'm Miss, Romper, Miss Helen in Romper Room, you know, looking through the glass. <laughs> the list goes on and on, and I can't name you all or it'd take forever, and I would forget someone for sure. It's not Judy Hannon's seat, but rather the community of Wallandilly's seat. And thanks to you all, I am so privileged and so honoured to represent you. I'd also like to acknowledge the previous members for Wallandilly, Philip Costa, Jai Rowell and Nathaniel Smith. I thank them for their service to the community. And I'd also like to commend the other candidates in the election. We had Angus Braden, who had just turned 18. We had Jason Webster and Rebecca Thompson and Ilako Haig. All of you represent a part of the community and I look forward to your input over the next four years. As I have learned as a councillor, even with different opinions, we can all get along for the benefit of others. I'd like to thank my family, my sisters Deborah and Lynette and their families. I apologise about pinching the soft drink and not returning your shorts. <laughs> we were told by our parents, jokingly, that we needed to elope the night before we tw turned 21 to save mum and dad the money on birthdays and weddings. My sisters, you both rock. To my forgiving children who have had interesting upbringing, I am so proud of all of you. Going to school in a very multicultural area of Granville but living on a small farm in Wallandilly built lots of character for my children. The teachers and the other students were always stunned by their excuses for running late, such as the cow had bloat and it had to be relieved by sticking a knife in it. <laughs> and I still remember the children sitting about two metres away from a pet cow giving birth and asking them what they thought. One replied, why did it go up there? <laughs> I adore my children. Alicia, who is unable to be here because she's got COVID, and Glenn, my son-in-law, who was recently naturalised by the other orange candidate. Lachlan Amelia and Morgan, my son, who's studying in Italy a PhD because he was so disillusioned with planning in New South Wales. I've also learnt that life throws you hurdles when you least expect it. A special mention to Lachlan and Amelia, as they've given me the most delightful identical twin grandsons, Arthur and Oscar, with Arthur undergoing treatment for leukaemia and the hours and the devotions where you've sat by his bed. Those two little boys are the delight for all of us and I love you all dearly. You're wonderful human beings who will fight for someone in trouble or being put down. I also remember a politician pulling me in really close and slamming a kiss straight on my mouth 
just to embarrass me. And my adult son, the once in Italy, responding back to him, he grabbed him by the hand, pulled him in and whacked a kiss on his mouth. <laughs> the look on the Polly's face was priceless. <laughs> Neil, my husband, who calls himself the handbag, has stood by me and thrown him in to whatever support I have needed. I know you, you know and you've learnt your wife's a bit crazy, a lot crazy, but very stubborn. Even we agreed no more politics. And my friend Noel Lowry said, just one more shot. <laughs> We've had our ups and downs, mostly ups. We've had some wonderful adventures to many countries and I'm still trying to explain to people why when I got elected, you left the country. <laughs> I love you and I thank you with all my heart. No one else can share the absolute pride we have in our wonderful children. Neil, your parents were the best in-laws one could hope for. Their support was wonderful. Even with the missing pet snake, your mother believed you could do no wrong. That was until she realised she was standing in the house it was missing in. <laughs> As both my parents passed away at very young ages and through their loss and my own illness, I have learnt that every day is precious and can be taken away in a blink. While I didn't have to wait as long for this job as King Charles III waited for his time, <laughs> it seemed like a lifetime to come to this parliament and who would have ever thought? Yes, I keep my brownie promise and I'm obviously persistent and I do like keep on learning. Dr Zeus, and people will laugh about me quoting Dr Zeus, but there's a lot of good stuff in those books. Dr Zeus wrote the lorics over 50 years ago, chronicling the plight of a community and the environment. And according to the words of the lorics says, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. Thank you to my community of the Wallandilly and the Southern Highlands for allowing me to care. Thank you. I, th I thank the member for Wallandilly for her inaugural speech. We'll now take some moment, uh, a moment for uh, the gallery and the chamber to settle. So, ladies and gentlemen, as you uh, leave, I hope you enjoy some time with the member for Wallandilly after this. <laughs>